Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome to today's webinar titled Walkthrough Bluetooth Mesh 1.1 and Bluetooth Network Lighting Control NLC. This is me, today's host. My name is Paweł Kanafek and I'm a product marketing engineer here at Nordic. But more importantly, this is today's expert, Umkar Kulkarni, the staff R&D engineer in the Bluetooth Mesh team at Nordic. He will walk you through all the recent changes. But before we go into it, let's take a look at some practicalities. Webinar will take around 60 minutes, 45 minutes of presentation and 15 minutes for Q&A session in the end. To submit your questions, please use the ask a question function in the top of the right sidebar. If you will have any questions after the webinar, you can always use the, our dev zone where we have our staff ready to answer these questions. A brief agenda for today. Mm, we'll focus both on the lighting vertical, but we'll also cover in details, the generic features of Bluetooth Mesh that can be used for a range of use cases extending far beyond lighting. We will cover both technical and practical angles. So whether you're a developer, engineer, product owner, or want to learn how NLC and Bluetooth Mesh 1.1 may impact the market, you'll find the relevant information here. We'll start with an introduction to wireless lighting control and NLC. Uh, I'll very briefly guide you on where to find more information about our SOCs and software for Bluetooth Mesh and Bluetooth NLC. Then Omkar will guide you through what's changed in the specifications and will present more details about the new features and enhancements of Bluetooth Mesh. Later, Bluetooth NLC profiles will be covered and in the end will present the currently supported features in the NRF Connect SDK. And then we'll proceed to Q&A session. Let me give you an overview of the wireless lighting controls in general. The increasing level of adoption of wireless lighting controls has its roots in the clear benefits of this approach. Wireless lighting control significantly reduces installation costs, so wires are no longer needed to connect switches, sensors and lights. This significantly reduces uh, the cost for new buildings and also for buildings undergoing renovation. Traditionally, lighting systems have struggled to achieve energy efficiency without compromising the experience. Lighting control solutions enable the adjustment of lighting based on occupancy and the environment to balance energy savings and comfort. Another key advantage is flexibility. Unlike traditional wired, wired setups, there is no need to reroute wires when the space is rearranged. Lighting controls also enables predictive maintenance and simplifies building management and operation by providing access to performance data. Now, let's explore how Bluetooth Mesh has gained its position in the wireless lighting control market. Bluetooth Mesh 1.0 enabled wider adoption of wireless lighting control. It was a major milestone at the time, but still it is a foundation for all systems based on Bluetooth Mesh and including Bluetooth and NLC. This specification introduced a short range wireless many-to-many -many communication using Bluetooth low energy transport. So the, the key difference here is the, the mesh topology. With wireless many-to-many -many communication, and with Bluetooth Mesh, it's possible to build scalable, robust, responsive, easy to deploy and runtime configurable network. So Bluetooth Mesh being based on Bluetooth Low Energy benefits from its economy of scale. So I wonder if you can guess how many Bluetooth Low Energy SOCs we ship a day. 
So it's over a million, uh, a million Bluetooth low energy SOCs a day. And that's the scale that helped to adopt a technology in the industry. So apart from the core networking protocol stack and SOCs, Bluetooth Mesh 1.0 also defined standardized application level mesh models. So we have a standardization on many levels, including the application already in 1.0 specification. Security was one of the key aspects covered by the Bluetooth mesh from the very beginning. I think it's safe to say that it's secure by design with the mandatory protection of the entire network. What's also important is that Bluetooth mesh devices can benefit from ubiquitousness of Bluetooth low energy. So these devices can interact with the network directly from mobile phones without the need for any bridging technology. With all these benefits, Bluetooth mesh 1.0 contributed to the wider adoption of wireless lighting control. Let's see that the pace of switching to wireless lighting controls is expected to accelerate. That's due to growing demand and advancements in the technology. According to recent report from ABI research that you see presented in the chart, it's estimated that wireless lighting ship shipments will outnumber those based on wired connectivity in 2027. We believe that recent developments in Bluetooth mesh technology and the introduction of Bluetooth NLC standards have had a significant impact on this prediction. So what Bluetooth NLC actually is? It is a set of standardized profiles for lighting related use cases based on Bluetooth mesh. It enables true multi-vendor interoperability because it is the only full stack standard for wireless lighting control with the standardization from the radio through the device layer. And at this point, I have to say that at Nordic, we are particularly proud of our role in the development of Bluetooth Mesh and NLC profiles. Our R&D teams have played an active role in shaping the specifications, including the most recent updates, always aiming to push the boundaries to provide the best possible technology. So before we'll proceed, I would like you to see where you can learn more about Nordic's product for Bluetooth Mesh. This is a comprehensive portfolio for your product development. You can simply go to product page at nordicsemi.com then you will find information about the SOCs, both from 52 and 53 series, development kits for these SOCs, NRF Connect SDK, that is our common software base for development. Uh, this covers Bluetooth mesh stack, samples, and more. And you will also find uh, resources for mobile applications including mobile applications that can be used as tools and libraries for your mobile application development. So now it's time to hand the mic over to Omkar. He's contributing to our Bluetooth Mesh R&D at Nordic, and he also helps in leading Bluetooth Mesh working group in the position of vice chair. So I'm sure this webinar will be interesting. Take it away, Omkar. Thank you, Pavel, for a nice introduction. Let's start with an overview of new features recently released in Mesh specifications. Firstly, we will talk about standardized device firmware update functionality. The Mesh DFU and Blob Transfer models bring a seamless standardized approach to upgrading your devices. Next up, we have a major enhancement in the form of standardized remote provisioning. And that's not all. The updated mesh protocol specification also encompasses crucial errata fixes, performance enhancements, routing capabilities, and network partitioning features. Improving the security, mesh protocol specification also adds privacy 
for network beacons and enhancement to the provisioning protocol, errata fixes in mesh model specification and minor improvements such as addition of optional metadata helps end products. Last but not least, the spotlight is on new Bluetooth NLC profile specifications. These are aimed at providing a true vendor level interoperability for common NLC devices. The newly rolled out Bluetooth mesh features are distributed in a set of 10 distinct specifications, two of which are the updated versions of the previous documents, the rest eight are new. Here is a list of all 10 new release documents and the features they contain. Mesh protocol version 1.1 and mesh model version 1.1 are the new releases of the previous documents. With the new release, Mesh Profile has been renamed to Mesh Protocol to highlight the focus of the document. These two specs contain numerous errata clarifications, new features, enhancements to Mesh Protocol and Mesh Models. Mesh Binary Large Object Transfer Model and Mesh Device Firmware Update Model define Device Firmware Update feature. Dimming Control NLC Profile, Basic Scene Selector NLC Profile basic lightness controller NLC profile, ambient light sensor NLC profile, occupancy sensor NLC profile, and energy monitor NLC profile belong to new class of specifications called as Bluetooth NLC profiles. These are targeted towards cross-vendor interoperability. Let's look at various features one by one, starting with device firmware update. We will refer to this feature in short as Mesh DFU. Many companies develop their own proprietary solutions that may not work with one another. With the introduction of DFU model specifications, Bluetooth Seek has standardized this crucial feature, bringing a new level of interoperability in mixed vendor ecosystem. The standardization of DFU is achieved through two components, Mesh DFU models and binary large object transfer models. Mesh DFU models offer a dynamic interface for carrying out both unicast and multicast firmware updates. They play a pivotal role in orchestrating the entire firmware update process. This involves querying nodes to identify their current firmware status, fetching the new firmware, initiating firmware transfers, and finally, instructing the blob transfer models to handle the binary firmware data transfer. And here is the added bonus. Once the updated firmware image is transferred, you have a flexibility to activate it at a later, more opportune moment. This allows unattended update of the devices in a network. With standardized DFU capabilities, Bluetooth mesh technology empowers your devices to stay up to date without disruption, ensuring smoother operations and easier maintenance. End products implementing DFU feature can implement one or more roles. Now let's break down the roles defined by the mesh DFU model specification. There are four roles, target role, initiator role, distributor role, and standalone updater role. Let's look at them one by one. Target role, this refers to the device that receives the firmware update binary over the mesh network. Initiator role refers to the device that triggers the firmware update process for one or more nodes. Higher layer application provides the list of target nodes. Once equipped with this information, initiator checks the capabilities of target devices within the network and gathers details about their existing firmware. It then collaborates with distributor to enable distributor to fetch the firmware image. Distributor role, acting on behalf of the initiator, the distributor ensures that the firmware reaches its intended destinations. This means the initiator doesn't need to be actively present during the distribution process. Standalone updater role. This role combines the initiator and distributor functions within a single device. Now, let's take a little bit closer look at how DFU feature is organized with the help of various mesh models. To get information about firmware available on the target nodes, initiator implements firmware update client model. 
Also, initiator node implements firmware distribution client to configure the distributor node. The configuration involves several items, mainly information about the firmware images, list of nodes, and block transfer parameters. Additionally, initiator implements block transfer client model to enable transfer of firmware image in band to the distributor. Now, in this case, in band transfer means transfer of binary firmware image data using block transfer model messages. Now, let's look at the distributor. On distributor node, block transfer server and firmware distribution server models are implemented to communicate with initiator. Use of mesh models to configure the distribution process to obtain the firmware makes distributor fully interoperable with any other initiator node. However, in addition to interoperable interfaces, it is also possible for distributor to receive the firmware distribution configuration and firmware image using out-of-band methods. Distributor also implements firmware update client model to set up and configure the firmware transfer process. Distributor uses blob transfer client model to send the firmware image to the target node. The target node implements corresponding pair models required for setting up the firmware image transfer and receiving the firmware image, namely firmware update server and blob transfer server models. In some application use cases, it could be sufficient to combine initiator and distributor roles in a single physical device. Such a device can simplify its construction by removing all internal models and instead prepare DFU transfer with the help of application and user interface. On such a device, it is sufficient to implement firmware update client and blob transfer client models to perform device firmware update on target nodes. The device can have an out-of-band interfaces for configuring firmware transfer and obtaining the firmware image. Such a device is referred as standalone updater. It is possible for devices with roles other than target nodes to instantiate models needed for target role and enable their own firmware upgrade via existing distributor node or by a distributor role running on the same node. Let's explore the next feature, remote provisioning. This is one of the major new features included in the mesh protocol version 1.1 specification. Imagine this scenario, a vast floor filled with newly installed unprovisioned mesh devices. The task at hand is to provision these devices without the hassle of traversing the entire floor. Additionally, there is the need to hand over the ownership of the network to a building operator, post commissioning, and to introduce new functionalities to devices with firmware updates when needed. This is where the new remote provisioning feature steps in, addressing the use case. Let's look at that. Remote provisioning eliminates the need for provisioners to remain constantly within direct radio range of unprovisioned devices. You can seamlessly add unprovisioned devices to the network remotely as long as they are within the range of a nearby mesh node that supports remote provisioning. Additionally, this feature helps in remote reprovisioning of already provisioned node, streamlining network lifecycle management and enhances device capabilities. This feature assists in securing transition of network ownership from network installer to building manager through device key update procedure. It also facilitates the initiation of a new term in a node's life cycle when luminaire gears are added or removed thanks to the composition and address update features of remote provisioning models. Now, we look at the backbone of remote provisioning feature. Remote provisioning server model and remote provisioning client model. These two models are essential components that enable the remote provisioning functionality. They encapsulate the provisioning protocol data units within mesh messages and transmit them across the mesh network. On one side, we have the remote provisioning client model, which interfaces with provisioning stack on the provisioner side. This model essentially initiates the remote provisioning process. On the other side, 
we find the remote provisioning server model residing within a node of a network. This model interacts with provisioning stack on the remote node, enabling two key functions. It either facilitates the reprovisioning of the node itself, or it communicates with provisioning node, making the entire process seamless and efficient. Remote provisioning feature does more than just provisioning unprovisioned devices. It also introduces a powerful concept known as the node provisioning protocol interface. This interface comes with distinct advantages. It enables not only the updating of a device's key, which facilitates secure network handover, but also allows for updating of nodes composition or address. This feature proves especially handy when it comes to seamlessly integrating plug and play Luminaire gears. One of the major advantages lies in the ability to update devices without the need for the cumbersome process of resetting and then reprovisioning them. This innovation in lifecycle management brings about a new abstract concept in the mesh protocol specification, a node storm. It will be good to mention this while we talk about remote provisioning. In essence, a term represents a distinct phase in the lifespan of a node. During this phase, the core attributes of the node remain constant. This includes vital elements like the structure of the node encompassing its device composition data and the unicast address of the node's elements. This provides a consistent expectation of node's capabilities and composition to the network operator throughout the node's terms. Now let's look at the other enhancements made in the mesh protocol specification. These enhancements are related to performance improvements, ability to support complex devices, proxy solicitation, and few other minor improvements. The performance improvements contain two main features, segmentation and reassembly configuration models and opcode aggregator models. Segmentation and reassembly feature allows large access PDUs to be segmented and transferred using smaller network PDUs. In mesh version 1.0, timing requirements of SAR are defined as minimum values. This leads to inefficient SAR-based message transfers when SAR transmitter and SAR receiver have non-optimal values chosen by implementer. In mesh protocol version 1.1, segmentation and reassembly procedure timing parameters can be configured at runtime using SAR configuration server and client models. This helps in tuning performance of a network containing devices from multiple vendors. Now let's look at another performance improvement, opcode aggregation. Often configuring nodes require the exchange of numerous mesh messages, each with its own overhead from application and network headers. This can lead to significant delays. Opcode aggregation models allow the combination of several smaller access messages into a single efficient message, drastically cutting down on overhead and optimizing the transfer between nodes. Referring to the illustration on the slide, here is how it works. The opcode aggregator client model combines access messages on the sender's end. The opcode aggregator server model takes care of unpacking the combined message, directing it to respective models, gathering their responses, and sending back a consolidated access message. The figure shows one-to-one -one correspondence between the individual items within a sequence message and individual status response items within a status message. This feature is a lifesaver for a complex node and network configurations, significantly reducing the time needed to get things up and running. Now we look at the next enhancement, the large composition data model. The composition data page state defines various features of a device. For example, composition data page zero defines the structure and features of a node, number of elements and model instances instantiated on those elements. In mesh version 1.0, size of the composition data page zero was confined by the access message size. This limitation poses challenges, especially for complex devices requiring many elements and capability to accommodate new plug and play auxiliary devices. Now, with large composition data server and client models, 
it is possible to exchange expansive composition data, which can be larger than the access message size, along with models metadata. This empowers the integration of more intricate and complex devices into the network. Not only that, but the models metadata feature allows for the exchange of valuable additional information about some mesh models. With this enhancement, the world of possibilities for device capabilities expands a lot. Moving forward, let's look at the new on-demand private GAT proxy feature, also known as proxy solicitation feature. Mesh users typically use cell phones to connect to the mesh network. However, they aren't always within the range of the network. When cell phones or proxy clients connect to the mesh proxy nodes, they use connectable advertisements. However, proxy nodes continuously broadcast these advertisements while waiting for proxy clients to connect. This approach can be inefficient and result in unnecessary radio traffic. In larger mesh networks, proxy advertisements contribute to overall traffic, potentially impacting network performance. Increasing advertisement intervals can negatively affect user experience. This is where on-demand private guide proxy feature is useful. This enhancement empowers proxy clients like smartphones to signal proxy servers when to initiate advertising by sending what is called as solicitation PDUs. This strategic approach significantly improves bandwidth usage, network performance and scalability. However, please note that for now, the sending of solicitation PDUs is currently implementable on the Android OS platform only. Now let's touch upon some miscellaneous improvements in mesh protocol specifications. As a part of cleaning up of the specification document, many identifier numbers are moved from the specification into the assigned numbers document. This document contains set of pre-assigned numbers assigned to several identifiers used by various Bluetooth specifications. Identifiers moved out of the mesh protocol and mesh model specifications include health fault codes, message op codes, mesh model IDs, and more. Additionally, optional metadata has been specified for health server model. That helps in exchanging information about the supported health model tests. The security architecture of mesh version 1.0 was robust and well thought through. However, additional feedback from members identified further enhancements to some of the security aspects of mesh protocol. Improving security of the protocols is always essential and benefits everyone. Let's look at the two security related improvements in the latest release of mesh protocol spec. The first one is a new feature called private beacons. In mesh version 1.0, Secure network beacons were crucial for network upkeep, aiding synchronization during IV index update and key refresh procedures. However, these beacons transmitted plain text data, such as flags, network ID, and IV index. Additionally, this data, along with authentication value, do not change often. This posed a privacy challenge. Imagine a scenario where a user carries a mesh device in their pocket and enters a supermarket. As this device continues to send out secure network beacons, the plain text data within these beacons could potentially allow observers in the supermarket to track the user's movement, raising privacy concerns. The new release of mesh protocol specification tackles this issue with the introduction of the private beacons feature. Private beacon feature adds a new beacon format that obfuscate the plain text data contained in the older secure network beacons by replacing it with a random value and obfuscated data fields. It also defines rules for frequently updating the random value within the beacon data and advertising address used in the packet. Since beacons are made private, it is also imperative to make proxy advertisements private to prevent someone connecting using the old proxy advertisements and find out the beacon data anyway. Therefore, this feature also provides a private proxy functionality that helps in preventing tracking of nodes via proxy feature. 
Turning our focus to the second security announcement, we will look at the provisioning protocol improvements. Previous version of the mesh specification used authentication algorithm that used AES CCM to generate 128 bit confirmation value. This algorithm had certain security risk against brute force attacks if secret value had insufficient entropy or if authentication value could be guessed. This algorithm also allowed devices to be provisioned without any authentication, creating a maintenance risk. For example, a rogue provisioner can provision all unprovisioned devices and go away, requiring costly efforts to reset the devices to their unprovisioned state. This aspect is improved in the new release of Mesh Protocol specification by introducing new provisioning authentication algorithm that uses HMAC SHA-256 function to generate 256-bit confirmation value. Provisioning protocol is also improved to allow unprovisioned devices to reject provisioning attempt carried out without selecting authentication scheme. It is worth noting that new provisioning authentication algorithm is the only mandatory feature in Mesh Protocol version 1.1. Let's also touch upon some additional features in Mesh Protocol specification that enable some additional new use cases. These features are currently not available in the NRF Connect SDK. Subnet Bridge feature in Mesh Protocol version 1.1 spec allows nodes to communicate across two different subnets. This helps in partitioning the network to optimize traffic and to enable guest access use cases. The subnet bridge is runtime configurable. Directed forwarding feature introduces a concept of routing for mesh networks. This feature is useful for very large and spread out networks where there are several hops between source and destination nodes. When this feature is enabled on all the relay nodes within a network and configured, the relay nodes will discover, establish and maintain path between source and destination nodes. In some situations, this helps with improving the traffic efficiency of the network compared to managed flooding. Certificate based provisioning feature enables wireless exchange of local or remote unprovisioned devices public key in an interoperable manner. It helps in ensuring that the given public key really belongs to certain UUID. This helps in bulk provisioning of many mesh devices securely when used together with static OB authentication method. Okay, now let's look at the updates in mesh model specification version 1.1. The only new feature in revised model spec is the addition of optional metadata to some of the server models. This metadata helps in identifying certain read-only properties such as range settings for lighting related models. Updated version of the mesh model spec also includes numerous ERAT updates clarifying several functional aspects of the models. The NRF Connect SDK implements all models of mesh model spec including all ERATA clarifications. Okay, now we come to the more interesting part. The launch of new class of specifications called as Bluetooth NLC profiles. Before we look at these NLC profiles, Let's look at how Bluetooth based wireless lighting evolved to understand how these profiles fit into the overall picture. Within a typical wireless lighting system, three distinctive layers interplay. The radio layer, the communication layer and the device layer. Beginning in 2010, Bluetooth LE was introduced. Innovative companies then harnessed this technology developing proprietary wireless networking systems atop the LE transport and crafting their own device layers. This led to a landscape of diverse lighting control systems. Let's fast forward to 2017. In 2017, a pivotal moment arrived when Bluetooth SIG unveiled the Bluetooth Mesh Profile specification. This standardization of communication layer provided the foundation for scalable many-to-many -many communication it was a crucial stride towards more efficient lighting control solutions. The mesh model spec 
simultaneously introduced application oriented models making an exciting advancement however this new found richness of features also gave rise to proprietary lighting devices that sometimes choose non compatible options with either none or limited interoperability for example the mesh specification required a minimum of two entries in the network message cache and some devices implemented exactly that this caused inefficient relay operation when such devices are subject to burst of network traffic this complexity underscores the need for streamlined approach leading to development of bluetooth nlc device profile specs these specs establish minimum requirement and parameters to cater to common wireless lighting use cases this evolution of bluetooth technology culminated in a full stack standard ushering in a new era of wireless lighting solutions marked by comprehensive standardization from the radio to the application layer this endeavor is aimed at fostering global interoperability and setting a strong foundation for the future of wireless lighting bluetooth nlc profiles bring six core application use cases in wireless lighting systems under the umbrella of standardization what's their primary objective to ensure a baseline of acceptable core mesh protocol performance across vendors this is achieved by the strategic enforcement of requiring specific mesh tag features the establishment of minimum values for crucial mesh protocol parameters and requiring some essential minimalistic behaviors to enhance device usability these profiles pave way for diversified and interoperable ecosystem of networked lighting control systems and devices it is a significant leap towards global interoperability with the help of ubiquitous presence of bluetooth le radio now let's briefly look at six nlc profiles and which devices they represent the dimming control nlc profile represents a dimmer or slider device the basic scene selector represents a device that provides ability to recall fixed set of scene numbers starting with scene number 1 to n where n is implementation dependent the basic lightness controller nlc profile represents a light fixture with sensor driven room layer control the ambient light sensor and occupancy sensor nlc profile represents ambient light and occupancy sensors respectively the energy monitor nlc profile represents a functionality to report energy consumption of a mesh device a single device can implement one or more instances of one or more profiles since device profiles is a new concept let's look at one example to understand what these bluetooth nlc profile specification contain we will take an example of ambient light sensor nlc profile this profile mandates certain mesh protocol features each serving crucial function to enable seamless integration with other nlc profiles and benefits real world use cases for provisioning purposes this profile mandates pb guide provisioning bearer complete local name or shorted local name ad types and attention indication this is mandated so that all nlc devices can provide a visual cue like a blinking light during provisioning procedure now on the mesh protocol bearer side the profile mandates advertising bearer and gat bearer also relay and proxy features are made mandatory why because they enable network planners to strategically place relays for optimal coverage of the network all the above mentioned features are mandatory for all six nlc profiles that have been mentioned on the previous slide the capabilities of the device matters too therefore certain minimum number of network keys app keys and minimum sizes of the replay protection list proxy filter list and message cache are mandated most importantly as this profile represent devices that will act as ambient light sensor in a wireless lighting network the profile mandates the use of sensor model with present ambient light level property along with sensor gain property to fulfill an application use case of ambient light sensor with tunable gain 
Now we have seen how Bluetooth NLC profiles are truly a game changer for fostering global interoperability in Bluetooth NLC systems. Let's look at the benefits these devices will provide to suppliers and buyers. For suppliers, NLC profiles bring much needed economics of scale in Bluetooth NLC market. Also, these profiles help eliminate the necessity for proprietary approaches for basic use case functionalities. This not only streamlines operations, but also slashes the expenses tied to maintaining such proprietary systems over time. Suppliers gain the leverage of a consolidated platform for addressing common use cases, fostering a more efficient development process. This in turn empowers them to channel their effort towards integrating value add features that distinguish their products in the market. Furthermore, Bluetooth NLC profiles enable the creation of diverse product offerings, each tailored to specific market segment, while retaining a consistent baseline of core mesh protocol features. This versatile approach ensures suppliers can cater to various needs while maximizing the impact of standardized solutions. It's a strategic advantage for suppliers encapsulating efficiency, innovation, and adaptability. Now let's look at the benefits for the buyers. First and foremost, these profiles offer true multi-vendor interoperability. This means that buyers have a freedom to choose components, such as switches, luminaires, and sensors from various suppliers. This flexibility in sourcing assures that the system's component can be tailored to meet specific preferences and requirements. Also, buyers get a sense of comfort that these devices will seamlessly work together. Deploying these systems is incredibly simple. All you require is a phone and a dedicated app. This user-friendly approach negates the need for specialized hardware, reducing the complexity and lowering the barrier to adopt wireless lighting controls. Moreover, the decentralized mesh architecture at the core of these profiles provide a level of flexibility in system configurations and expansions. With the ability to configure and expand systems at granular level, buyers can adapt to changing needs without a hassle. In essence, these profiles underscore that the power of choice, simplicity, and flexibility converge together to redefine the buyer's experience in the world of network lighting control systems. The NRF Connect SDK brings a wealth of possibilities to the table by offering comprehensive implementations of numerous new Bluetooth mesh features. Let's look at which features are provided in the SDK and how this SDK empowers developers to harness the full potential of Bluetooth mesh technology in their projects. The NRF Connect SDK provides device firmware update and blob transfer, remote provisioning, all mesh enhancements, private beacons, and provisioning improvements, and all Bluetooth NLC profiles. These features are available for prototyping and developmental work on end products. We plan to qualify the listed features in upcoming revisions of the NRF Connect SDK. Why select NRF Connect SDK? Developing your mesh products with an RF Connect SDK gives you many advantages. For starters, the SDK comes equipped with a fully qualified Bluetooth mesh stack. This ensures your product is built on a solid foundation of mesh technology. The SDK leverages an established ecosystem built upon the robust Zephyr real-time operating system. This translates to a proven framework that has stood the test of time. The SDK comes with a multitude of additional components and drivers that are essential for crafting Bluetooth mesh based end products. Its open source nature encourages collaboration and contributions, fostering a dynamic development community. When it comes to application development, the NRF Connect SDK offers a seamless experience through the integration with Visual Studio Code, integrated development environment, enhanced by the NRF Connect extension. But that's not all. We also offer complementary mobile application libraries, implementing Bluetooth mesh features 
empowering you to build your own branded Bluetooth Mesh apps without reinventing the wheel. Together with easy to use development kits and strong development support through DevZone portal, NRF Connect SDK is the go-to platform for developing new Bluetooth Mesh and products. Let's do a quick recap as we wrap up this webinar. New updates to Bluetooth Mesh technology marks a transformative milestone in the world of wireless lighting, enabling seamless connectivity and rich set of features. Updated mesh specifications offer a more robust framework for secure, flexible and scalable many-to-many -many communication, catering to diverse use cases. Bluetooth NLC profiles emerge as a key factor in fostering true multi-vendor interoperability, standardizing applications and ensuring seamless compatibility. For suppliers, embracing Bluetooth Mesh means bidding farewell to proprietary solutions, reducing maintenance costs and focusing on value-added features that shape the industry. Buyers, on the other hand, reap the rewards of true interoperability with diverse sourcing options streamlined deployment and a decentralized architecture that grants them greater flexibility and expansion possibilities. We encourage you to harness the new features of Bluetooth Mesh and channel them into your ideas and projects with the help of NRF Connect SDK. Thank you very much, Omkar. Let's start the Q&A session. Mm. Let's start from the earliest questions. Um, first one is about the recording. Yes, the recording will be available. Uh, what we do is we run two sessions to cover all time zones. And after that, we put together both Q&A sessions in one recording and we will release the on-demand webinar in a day or two. Next question about the materials. Yes, the materials will be available with the recording on demand. And you can also download the materials now, now in the handout function. The next question to Omkar. In a mesh DFU model, uh, can Android or iOS phone uh, be an initiator? Yes, that's the intention and the vision behind the DFU specification uh, that mobile phones or tablets can serve as uh, initiator role. It could also be uh, from a gateway device, but that's not necessary. Okay. Uh, the next question is coexistence of mesh stack and NRF 51.540 front-end module is supported by NRF Connect SDK. Yes, so uh, <clears throat> integration of the front-end module is uh, supported for all Bluetooth samples. And in each uh, sample documentation, you would also uh, see the mention of this. All right. Can mesh node and BLE peripheral role coexist? Yes, of course. Uh, mesh nodes and BLE peripheral roles can coexist with one another. And that's how the mesh proxy functionality work. Basically, mesh proxy node is a BLE peripheral. And you can have, and of course, you can have uh, many more services simultaneously running on the node. However, uh, you shouldn't put too many connections to a single mesh node because when mesh node is connected to other uh, devices through GAT connection, it will lose the scanning time. So you need to balance how many uh, simultaneous connections you want to establish to the node when it is participating in the network operation. Okay. Uh, 
Mm. Yes, we have uh, two more questions. The first one is about how does BLE 1.1 compare to ZigBee Mesh implementations? I guess it's about BLE Mesh 1.1. Okay. Onkar, can you take it? Yes. So, uh, <laughs> BLE Mesh and ZigBee Mesh, they are very different. So, let's, um, let me give you a very brief uh, few, sec uh, few seconds uh, quick overview. BLE Mesh works on uh, uh, 2.4 gigahertz band and it uses the radio channels as defined in the Bluetooth specifications. Whereas ZigBee works on 18... Um, uh, 15.4 IEEE standard that defines the radio channels required for this purpose. Bluetooth mesh is completely connectionless. It uh, it uses advertising PDUs, uh, whereas uh, Zigbee mesh has something called as listen before talk, and it forms uh, uh, it forms specific channels to talk to various nodes around it. However, uh, this feature can also lead to uh, performance bottlenecks. In Bluetooth Mesh, the uh, data rate of the file is quite high. It's almost one megabits per second. For Zigbee, it's a quarter of that. So going towards the architecture, these two technologies are quite different from one another. And we believe uh, Bluetooth Mesh performs better in large installation because of the statistical advantage it has in the form of uh, several network retransmits, scanning windows, and simultaneous transmission on three advertising channels. Okay. Uh, next simple question. What is the maximum length of a private beacon? Hmm. All right. I need to recollect that. I think uh yeah i think it is 26 octet long excluding the ad type and the length okay. is there a next question Yes, there is a question about which version of NRF LTK Zephyr provides Mesh 1.1 and NLC. And uh, in the latest version of uh, SDK, there is uh, support for majority of Mesh 1.1 features and experimental uh, support for NLC uh, profiles. Experimental means that it's uh, fully functional, but not mature enough to be used for the final product, but it will be available uh, in the in the more mature version uh, in the following SDK releases. You can find the details about the support of features uh, on the product page or in the documentation for Bluetooth Mesh. Mm -hmm. What are the advantages of BLE Mesh 1.1 NLC over Matter? Okay, so I will try to uh, answer for that. Um, I'm not working on the Matter technology directly. So, however, I will try to provide you an answer based on uh, my knowledge. So, Bluetooth Mesh benefits from uh, Bluetooth low energy support available in many mobile phones, tablets, and laptops, and does not necessarily need additional gateway. Bluetooth Mesh architecture is, uh, is decentralized, and, and it can work on its own without the need for internet connectivity, unless someone needs to monitor or control it remotely. Matter communication is generally centralized around bridges, uh, and that's that's that could be one of the disadvantages with matter. Since BLE is BLE mesh is decentralized, it can be easily scaled. For example, there is one case study published on the Bluetooth website that shows uh, mesh deployment in multi-story building having thousands of Bluetooth mesh nodes. Uh, matter over thread 
has a bandwidth limitation because how the thread works. Matter over Wi-Fi might work uh, reasonably well, but that has a higher power consumption issue. And these two problems do not exist with Bluetooth mesh since it uses native uh, Bluetooth low energy transport. Yeah, uh, maybe some addition from my side, Finn uh, uh, I am in this webinar to help Pavel a bit, but I'm also responsible for Meta. So this is uh, quite a nice question for me. Uh, the main thing in my, uh, to keep in mind for this is that the indicated use cases are a bit different. So at the moment, Meta is strictly targeting the smart home. And that might go into a different direction eventually, but at the moment, most of it works for the smart home. That means, for example, uh, as Umka mentioned, if you get into the hundreds or thousands of devices, the network isn't made for that. And then in addition, depending on what you want to use, if you want to use Meta over Thread or Meta over Wi-Fi, you will, for example, for Meta over Thread, you will always need a border router and it, you, you will have a centralized system. Uh, which you might not want for dearly mesh. There's also lower uh, area or uh, lower barrier of entry because for Meta, you always need to set up the, the system basically. As far as I understand it, for mesh, you can just, well, you can start with one device. And yes, exactly. That, yeah, that doesn't work for, for Meta um, unless your first device is your hub. Um, and then I think that's. Pretty much it. So the, the main thing to keep in mind is both of these work quite well, but they, they are they have different areas where they are strong. And the main thing where Meta is really good is uh, it combines different standards to like fulfill this one use case that it's working towards at the moment and is using different protocols to achieve that. Okay. okay. It's yeah. great to have two experts on the call on both technologies. Let's proceed to another question. Uh, what's the maximum number of nodes capacity in a BLE mesh network? Well, yeah. uh, maximum number of nodes uh, can be 32,000. 32767. OK. Next question is about ESL. Is the BLE mesh used in the electronic share levels market? Uh, I can take this question. Uh, so ESL has been recently uh, announced this year. And uh, for ESL, Bluetooth offers uh, another technology that was introduced in uh, Bluetooth 5.4 specification, that is periodic advertising with responses. And on top of that, uh, there is ESL uh, profile, especially dedicated for this solution. So there we have a star topology instead of mesh, but this, so this, this is exactly designed to address ESL market. Next question. Is remote provisioning affected by the size of the replay cache on the provisioner? Yes. So <clears throat> provisioner is a node uh, which generally uh, talks to the entire network uh, because it needs to provision the devices and then configure them. So mesh specification has a requirement that states that if a node is not able to do replay protection, then it must ignore the incoming packet, which means for a provisioner to be able to talk to the entire network, it needs to have number of entries in its replay protection cache equal to number of addresses being used in that particular network. So if you plan to provision 1000 node network containing 1000 addresses, then the provisioner's replay cache should have at least 1000 entries. A few more questions are coming in. Uh, let's take the next one. What is the average power consumption of a repeater node? 
ओके सो रिपीटर नोड मीनिंग मेश रिले नोड इन अ नेटवर्क स्कैन ऑल द टाइम एंड देन ट्रांसमिट दैन एडवर्टाइजमेंट बैक इन टू द नेटवर्क सो बेसिकली एवरेज पावर कंजम्पन वुड बी सेम एज दावर कंजम्पन ऑफ एन आर एफ चिप वेन इट्स इन आईदर स्कैनिंग और ब्रॉडकास्टिंग मोड सो दैट्स बेसिकली if i remember the numbers correctly from data sheet around 7 or 8 uh, milliampere all right uh, next question also to you omkar what is the maximum of light node in one network theoretically um i i didn't get the question uh, what is the maximum of light node in one network um, maximum uh, size or power or current consumption maybe the person who answered who asked it uh, can clarify but i would assume it's about the number of light nodes in one network ah yeah okay so the number of maximum number of nodes depends on how many addresses are being used in a network so each mesh node can have one or more addresses in it so each mesh node comprises of several elements the primary element has a unicast address secondary secondary elements also have unicast address so one physical mesh node can represent several addresses so the maximum number of light nodes in a network will actually depend on how many number of addresses being used by each single node in a network generally if you base your light node on a light control model in the mesh model specification or as shown by the basic lightness controller nlc mesh profile then you would need at least two elements on each device that means each mesh node would use two addresses which means you could have maximum of 16000 lights in one network one logical network Can you provide more details on time frame when mesh 1.1 certification may occur? Should we expect all 1.1 capabilities be released in NRF Connect before certification occurs? Okay. So, uh we do not have currently we do not have subnet bridge mesh directed forwarding and certificate based provisioning excluding these three features. We have uh implemented all other features uh, in the mesh 11 and mesh nlc profile specifications so we are aiming for certification in next uh, release of this specification and uh, we will provide the updates in the documentation sorry uh, we we are aiming for certification in the next release of the nrf connect sdk uh, i think that's in, uh, in in upcoming months I hope that's that answers the question. Yeah, but uh, currently, according to what was presented before, the features that were listed are functional. I could say fully functional. And, yes, and ready for development. That's that's really great. Yes. Okay, and the last one is about the TFU. Does the mesh TFU support transmitting multiple images? For example, a device may have multiple cores or processors and need to update more than one firmware image at once. Yes. <clears throat> so mesh TFU um, at the protocol level is not uh, is not defined to be concerned about. Uh, how is the end device architecture whether it has single core multiple cores etc etc the mesh dfu feature allows distributor node to cache multiple firmware images and send them to the receiving target nodes so in short yes the spec doesn't limit uh, image update to a single core or multiple core it's more an implementation detail and it's possible I think there's one in the normal chat if you want to answer that. Oh, I haven't seen that. Thank you, Finn. Okay. So the question is about the support with NRF 52811. Uh would Omkar, do you know if NRF 52811 support NLC or do we need um, 52832? 
okay it's a bit trick question well uh, we haven't <laughs> officially announced uh, 52 8 11 support because some of the uh, bigger nlc profiles they require more uh, footprint so uh, i would recommend to use uh, 52 832 however uh, for the light switch and the dimmer uh, applications uh, this device may be used but uh, please check uh, with the with the nordic uh, sales through the dev zone okay and uh, another question arrived in also in relation to matter Mm. Is does mesh product require a certification process similar to matter product? Uh, okay, so I will tell you the certification process for the mesh product, and I think uh, maybe Finn could help with the matter product. So the certification pro uh, pro process for mesh product is just like any other Bluetooth LE product. Nordic would provide a qualified stack containing uh, necessary functionality pre-qualified. So all you have to do is create your own qualification listing by referring to the Nordic stack and ensure that you are not modifying any open source functionality uh, so that it breaks the qualification. So Bluetooth LE qualification is more a declarative process where you as an OEM manufacturer, you declare that you satisfy the qualifying requirements. And then Bluetooth SIG will check your application and then uh, give you the qualification. Yeah, uh, for Meta, that's a bit different. So uh, you have to qualify first of for the protocols. So for example, Bluetooth LE and Thread, uh, that's the normal certification process for Bluetooth LE and Thread. And then you would have additional certification for uh, with the CSA for the Meta product. And then, of course, the normal ones like CE, FCC, but that's not for the protocol, that's for the product in the end. But yes, uh, for Meta, you would need the protocols that you're using and an extra Meta certification. And it seems that, that are, there are no more uh, questions. So thank you very much for your attendance and uh, see you in our next webinars. Thank you very much.